Please be seated. Our opening hymn used the words indescribable, uncontainable, incomparable, as it was reflecting on God. Today I want to celebrate God who is mystery. And yes, celebrate. And we'll start with Latin. Who did Latin at school? I did five years from standard three to standard seven or something, and then I gave up. All I can remember was a mower, mass, a mat. So maybe you understand this without having to look up the translation. God is mystery. But what's important for you and for me to remember? When we say God is mystery, that doesn't mean we can't understand. What it does mean is that our understanding never ends. It is always being deepened. So by saying God is mystery is opening a door to a deepening understanding journey that never ends. <coughs> Mysterium tremendum et faciens means a mystery before which humanity both trembles and is fascinated, is both repelled and attracted. So God can appear both as an wrathful or awe-inspiring or as gracious and lovable. So the mystery of God can be tremendous and fascinating or one that, yeah, keep away from me, as Peter did uh, in his first encounter with Jesus. So what does it mean? Today I just want to talk through four very simple points. Don't box God. What's that? What you see is what you get. Surprise! Medicate. Don't box God. Moses was told not to box God into the old Egyptian God ways of thinking or of his father-in-law priest of Midian. I am who I am. Don't tell me who I should be and I will be who I will be. Don't box me, God is saying. I have a history with you. I was the God of your fathers, but don't box me. Jesus too, who do you say I am? Who do they say I am? The disciples pulled out of their boxes, out of their options. Jesus allowed them to play with the ideas. And when Peter got the big truth, Jesus, keep it quiet, hold on to its intention and in confidence. Why? Because he knew if it leaked out, people would have jumped out of boxes, pushed him into boxes, and there would have been even more chaos with understanding him. We see it, his interactions with the religious leaders of the day, always trying to box God. Jesus didn't fit into their boxes. Yo, did that upset them? When we box God, we do this to our detriment. God will not be boxed. So why do we want to box God? Largely because of our need for control. When I understand God, I can put him in a little box. Then who's in charge? Me. God says, no, you can't box me. I won't be boxed. So we celebrate, friends, a bigger God than any box we can put God into. A deeper God than any box that can control him. Because it's not about our control, but abandoning ourselves to the deeper journey of understanding the mystery at new and new and new levels of awe and wonder. What you see is what you get. I want to look now at two main ways, amongst others, that we come to know God. Firstly, what you see is what you get. God appears to reveal God's self in the ways that we're looking. God uses our framework 
to reach out and to tap into who you are. So here's a picture of people in a vibrant, charismatic worship service like we've just celebrated. In that context, God will come to them in a vibrant way in order to deepen and enhance. If you were here an hour or so ago, you would have been at our earlier morning service, much more traditional, much more sedate, with some wonderful hymns. And God would appear to them in a more traditional, quiet kind of way, deepening and transforming them. So we celebrate, friends, a God who comes to us where we are and relates to us where we are. What we are seeing, God comes to and responds to in that. And I found that fascinating. God, who we say made this universe and who we say reveals himself in and through the universe, God often uses the very principles and the laws of the universe he put in place to play games with us. What do I mean? Let's look at three of those. You can look at others on your own. What about light? We've slowly come to understand that when we study light, it can appear to us as a wave and as a particle, and the two seem not to kind of work together. Although that picture at the top there is meant to be the picture of light appearing as as a wave and a particle simultaneously. Don't ask me how it does that, but it's a nice picture anyway. And so often we just have to say, nice picture. God won't be boxed like light won't be boxed as a wave or a particle. Let me be light. Don't tell me how I must operate. The observer effect is this fascinating one, which says that the principle is that the act of observing will influence the phenomenon being observed. Scientists discovered that because they were involved in looking at something, that interaction changed the way that whatever they're looking at behaved. God does that. You see, God is about intimacy. So as we observe God, as we seek to understand God, God responds to that and responds accordingly to meet our needs, which is why your experience of God is going to be different to your experience of God, to be different to yours, because you are the observer. We are different observers. And the observer effect says that In this funny way, God plays games with us. Nice games, responding into our needs as a relationship. The third one's even more complicated. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. That sounds Lani, doesn't it? Well, it is Lani, but it's also confusing. Have a look at that. It states that the more accurately the momentum of a particle is measured, the less its position can be known and vice versa. And boy, that's so true with God. The more we hone in and understand one aspect of God, the more blurred another aspect becomes. We thought we had nailed. So we get back into that and we hone in there, we make sense of that, and then the other one gets blurred. So God plays around with the principle that Heisenberg named after himself, but God put it there in the first place. Maybe it should be God's uncertainty principle Heisenberg discovered and we experience in our own relationship with God. But this is wonderful, isn't it? The God who we are trying to understand reveals God's self to us in so many different ways. We are part of the process. One minute God says, I'm this. Next minute God says that. We've got to hold the tension. It reminds us that we're finite, that we can't put God in a box. The second main way that God reveals God's self to us is almost in contrast to that one. And it's this. Surprise! Did I wake anyone up? The God of the Bible is in the business of surprising his people with his plan, his care, and his future for them. God touches us in a surprisingly personal and transformational way. But why is God so surprising? Why does he work this way? Well, Scripture's full of these hints. For one, God doesn't think on a human level. We know the scripture, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, from Isaiah. God seems to like working contrary to the world's wisdom, Corinthians. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. 
God chooses to associate with people we don't like. That rattles our cage. We don't like God doing that. But God does anyway. I want to say something about a surprise. A surprise is a surprise. Huh? What it means is you can't live in the state of a surprise permanently. Why? It just becomes stale. You know, when people jump out at you and it's a nice surprise the first time, you've always got the little kid who's done it the seventh time and you've got to act surprised, okay? If God was doing that all the time, we would say, God, grow up sometime. But also, we have a tendency to take a surprise and make it the norm. Peter did that up the mountain, transfiguration, amazing surprise experience. Jesus with all these uh, Elijah and Moses, wow. What does he say? Let's build something we can remember this. Let's build a church here, a temple here, a place here, a shelter. All around the Holy Land, some of you have been there. All you've got is buildings to commemorate. People like to fixate on things. If we do that in our lives, we're going to be disappointed. A surprise is a surprise for a purpose. A mountaintop experience is a mountaintop experience for a purpose. You can't stay there. You need to respond to it by not trying to recreate it, redo it. No, accept it for what it is, unpack it, and live out of the learned experience from it. Don't try and go from a high to a high. It doesn't work in our Christian faith. I see too many people trying to crank up something or trying to live in the one experience they ever had and it's kind of fixated them 20 years ago. The great saints of our history, when they had the one experiences, and most of them only had the one, they spent the next 30 years unpacking the one experience, deepening their understanding of the mystery who God will be. The second thing about surprise is this. Every time you're going through a very dark moments or periods in your life, remember, like Eskim, God has switched the lights off. But instead of Eskim, because God wants to throw you a surprise party. So hold on with some kind of expectation. We often talk about things like dark nights of the soul and the spirits and all those negative things. But remember, when the people come out of them, the depth and the surprise is amazing. So we celebrate a God who is a God of order, but also a God of disorder, and then a God of reorder. And the reorder is always new and transforming and fresh. A God who out of the darkness brings the blinding light. And all we can do is say, wow, aha, now I see. And the last one, do you remember the fourth one? Medicate yourself. See the pill box? When you get to my age, and a lot of you are there and beyond, and some of you are younger, and you have to take daily medications as part of life, eh? Hey? And they need to be daily. You can't have a once-off surprise medication. Yes, for certain conditions that works. But for most of us, it's a chronic condition. So we need to be regularly. And when you don't, you know about it. Or your doctor tells you, you know about it. It's the same in our spiritual journeys. We need good, regular doses of the right amount of spiritual disciplines because that's the medicine that heals us, transforms us, changes us inside out. Big surprises are wonderful. But we need the regular moments of Bible reading and prayer, of study and reflection, of silence and solitude, of gaining insight and applying it, of believing and trusting, of learning and relearning and living we can become, and all of you who know, know this for yourself, unhealthy if you don't take your regular medicine, your regular God-given vitamins. So the question, what are you doing to bring change into your life on a regular basis, allowing God to work deeply and transformationally as you regularly medicate yourself? Or you're once a year when it's Lent kind of person. You're trying to zoom it all up. Hopefully it'll last for the next 18 months. No, what's many months? 10 months or something. I don't know. How long is Lent? So here's somebody's suggestion. Divert daily, withdraw weekly, maintain monthly, and abandon annually. Daily, 
divert from the distractions of the world with quiet times, with daily Bible reading and prayer. Weekly withdraw from the busy schedule. Do a Sabbath. Come to church. Go during the week to a home group. These are withdrawal opportunities that are part of the rhythm. And if you've been part of any of those, you know what it's like when you don't. You feel the physical withdrawal in your body. Maintain monthly. Find a time once a month you do something new and special. Join our uh, every third Saturday quiet morning. It's a kind of monthly uh, dig deep, which stimulates us in different ways. We changed our third one, which was meant to be yesterday, for next week, so you can still join in. And we're going to listen to Michael Cassidy share some of his wisdom as being someone who has medicated himself with God for a long time across at St. Margaret's from 10 o'clock. You do have to then have some discipline because you will miss a particular rugby game of some sort. Abandon annually. Go on holiday. You don't have to do religious things all the time. Have a good time on holiday. Maybe you do want to take a retreat annually to recharge your batteries. These are important aspects of living the Christian life and medicating ourselves in, on this journey. God has designed us in particular ways and he needs to work in us in all these different ways. So please don't box God. I spend most of my time in ministry, and Mandy does as well, unboxing God in people's lives. They come to us and they've boxed God. And subtly and carefully we had to open the wrappers and let God out. And some people don't want, they hold on to that box. They don't want us to open it because they are scared of who might pop out. Remember, God will meet you where you are. What you see is what you will get. Wonderfully true and wonderfully deepening. But be ready for the surprises. Some people get surprised and because they're not ready for it, they don't even know it happened. And lastly, do the medication, people. Take your pills. Get out there and do the spiritual disciplines that we know and the spiritual giants of the past that's what kept them going. They had their surprises, but it was the daily medication that made them the saints we call them. Amen.